Hello, this is David Harper of the Bionic Turtle. In this screencast, I'd like to illustrate the importance of N of D2 in the Black Shoals Merton option pricing model. This topic has come up this week in the forum, and I consider this useful and maybe even important to my FRM candidate customers. So what I have here is the formula for the price or value of a European style call option. That small c, by the way, denotes European, not American style. If it were capital C, that would mean American style. So this tells us the price according to the of the call option, according to the Black Shoals Merton, is stock price minus discounted strike price. And both of those are adjusted by the standard normal cumulative distribution functions. However, the one that's useful and interesting to us is N of D2. Why is that? Because it turns out that N of D2 is the probability that this option will be struck in the risk neutral world, not in the real world, but in the risk neutral world. It is the idea behind the Merton model to credit risk. We actually can zoom in on this N, uh, N of D2 or D2 in particular. So I'm going to take away the black shoals so that I can just zoom in on the D2. And here it is. So that was, the, that was the D2 that's inside of the standard normal cumulative distribution function in the Black Shoals. And what I'd like, what I'd really like for my FRM candidates is for them to understand the intuition of D2 because this really captures the idea of the Merton model that we see in credit risk. And that Merton model is a structural model. That's because it's using the firm's value to infer the probability of default. So we go from regular option inputs in call option pricing to using inputs that concern the firm because, remember, the key idea of the Merton model is that we're treating the firm's equity like a call option on the firm's assets. And so here I have an input assumption of $130 million for firm value. That corresponds to stock price. Then I have an input assumption of debt. That corresponds to the strike price. So I am saying that the firm's debt is $100 million. Here it is drawn in red, and we're going to call that the default threshold. In other words, we're going to simulate or assume that if the firm's value drops below $100 million, this red line, then it defaults. So it corresponds to the strike price. Now the actual default threshold is probably less than debt, but that's a separate detail. Then we have a mu for the expected return, I'll assume 5%, uh, time period of one year. So this is a simple single period model and a volatility of 20%. So now D2, which again, remember, was inside or embedded inside the black holes, is implementing this idea here, which does have an intuition. And we start here at time zero, that's today. Note that the firm's value is 130, the default threshold is 100. So even before, at time zero, we're already out of the default by some distance. And in fact, that's this term right here. See natural log of S over K. If I do that math right here, natural log of 130 divided by 100, I get 26%. This is on a continuously compounded basis. So in other words, just starting from today, inherent in the existing capital structure, the value of the firm would have to drop by 26% before default. Okay, but we're not dealing with today. We're interested in the end of the period. So we basically simulate the growth in the firm from 130 to where we expect it to be, its average endpoint. Happens to be about 134 here. That's captured right here by adding the expected return here are of 5%. So that see how the 5%, see how the firm's 130 million starting value today grows by 5% to where it ends up to the expected average value here. And note, it doesn't grow by quite 5%. Volatility is eroded by returns. This is a geometric average. It's a separate idea. So just note that this is going to be 5% reduced by one half the variance. Again, volatility erodes returns. But you can see here in the, you can see here in the numerator, all we've done is take the, the growth that's already implicit in the capital structure. In this case, there's a 26% distance 
and then add almost the 5% growth over the single period to end up here at the numerator, that's calculated right here, of 29.2%. In other words, if the firm grows as expected, we expect it to get right here at the, P, at the uh, average of its distribution, it'll be about 29.2% above what we call the default threshold. And you can see in here, I've got that formula, I've implemented the natural log of the firm's value divided by debt, the default threshold, plus the expected return eroded by one half the variance. Now, 29.2% above default, we need to standardize that because that is meaning that is severe or not severe depending on this distribution and the volatility of the firm's assets. So that's where the 20% comes into play. The 20% is basically in the denominator. So we divide the 29.2 by the 20% and that gives us the D2. And you can see visually, here's where we end up. It's 29.2% above default threshold. Given that the dispersion or standard deviation of this distribution is 20%, that means in standard, standard normal units, the expected value of the firm is 1.5 standard deviations above the default. So that's our D2, and that's why we can call this D2 the distance to default. It's the 29.2%, but converted into standard normal terms, or in other words, 1.5 standard deviations. Now, if you see that this distribution is turned on its head, if we are assuming normality, we can now use simple statistics to try and figure out, to try and ask the probability default question, which is, if this is the distribution, here's the peak, what's the probability we'll end up here in the tail? Well, that is simply, if I hit the, if I look at this function, it's norm s dist of negative d2, which in this case happens to be 7.2%. But that's just a lookup table on the normal distribution where our z value is 1.5. In other words, if this is the distribution, then this tail right here below the threshold is 7% of the total. So there's a 7% probability, 7.2% probability that will end up in the tail, in other words, that this firm will default. So that's why, D2, that's why D2 gives us the distance to default, and N of D2, the standard normal distribution, gives us the probability of default in the Merton model. So I wanna say just two other things for my FRM candidate customers in particular. One is that this D2 matches the math in the Black-Scholes option pricing model. Notice we there's correspondences here. The firm value of 130 corresponds to stock price. The default threshold of 100 corresponds to the strike price. However, there's one significant change in difference, and that is in the option pricing model, we went from a risk-free rate to the Merton model, where we used an expected growth on the firm's assets, which we know is not riskless. It's going to be higher than riskless. That's a key change. We go from risk neutral in option pricing to expected growth in firm's assets in the Merton model. It's, it seems subtle, but it's really not. The second thing is that the Merton model, you'll recall here, allows us to treat this distribution here as normal, and therefore we can use a simple lookup to get the percentage of the area in the tail. Now remember I said the KMV approach uses the Merton model, but not all the way. And, that, and it, this last step, KMV is not taking a parametric or normal distribution, in other words, they're looking at the distance of default, in this case 1.5 standard deviations, and they're then converting that into a probability default or expect default frequency based on historical patterns. So put another way, this use of normality here implies the normal or skinny tails, but the actual tails may be fatter, so KMV doesn't take this last step of converting a distance to default into a PD with this parametric normal, but rather it does something more sophisticated with an actual lookup. But that basically describes the idea of D2, and I hope this was helpful. This is David Harper, The Bionic Turtle.